أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق يجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا دليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضا ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم For the hastening of the reappearance of the master, the savior, the avenger الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري recite aloud صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah At-Tawbah, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah, wa kunu ma'a s-sadiqeen. Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim. In this verse, the all-merciful creator of the universe instructs believers and the reason believers are the target audience for this verse is because this comes as a step that follows believing in him. He then elaborates on what belief entails Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, ittaqu Allah, maintain taqwa. And I'll explain what taqwa means in a nutshell. But he starts off by saying that you must possess taqwa, wa kunu ma'al sadiqeen, and be with the ones who are truthful. What is taqwa? In English, it is often translated as piety. Piety meaning deep religious devotion. When someone is extremely religious and attempts to maintain the principles and the tenets of their faith, they're referred to as pious individuals. 
But the word taqwa is not translated as piety, at least not accurately. So what does it actually mean? It stems from the word waqa, yaqi. In other words, it means protection. It means to guard oneself. Sometimes that is understood to mean that we should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, this is a common mistranslation, which isn't accurate because when you fear something, you flee from them, you run away from them. We don't go towards the things that we fear. And so it's a negative interpretation of the term. We're supposed to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are supposed to engage in good deeds such that we invoke the love of Allah towards us. So the fear of Allah is not a correct translation of the term taqwa. The hadith famously states, لا تخف إلا ذنبك ولا ترج إلا ربك. Imam al-Sadiq tells us that you should only fear your own sins. And so when we colloquially say that you should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we mean is that you should fear the wrath of Allah. In other words, when I commit acts of sin and transgression, that will lead or might potentially lead to the, to the wrath of Allah, to the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's what I should be afraid of. And so it is not to fear Allah Himself. Why would you fear God? God is the creator of the universe. He's the one who brought us all into existence from nothing. As Fatima al Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam says in her Fadakiya sermon. Allah brought us all into existence. He gave us everything we have. Every moment of joy and pleasure and happiness is because Allah created us. So why should we fear Him? Number one. Number two, you only fear someone when you're afraid. So either because you've committed a crime or a sin that would invoke His wrath, or when you haven't committed a sin, but you fear them anyway, because they happen to be unjust. They are oppressive. They're tyrannical. And yet, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is none of those things. So why would you fear Him? Which is why the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam have spoken in absolutely remarkable terms when speaking about us fleeing the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the anger of the divine, they speak like this, as does the blessed Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam in dua, Abi Hamza al-Thumali. Hariban minka ilayk. Even when I flee Allah, I flee from His wrath, but I have nowhere else to go. No one will treat me with a modicum of the mercy and compassion and kindness and generosity and forgiveness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exhibits towards His creatures. So what do we do when we run from Him? We run towards Him. Hariban minka ilayk. Subhanallah. So, to say that piety or taqwa rather means that we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not entirely an accurate characterization of the term. So, what does taqwa mean then? Some have said that taqwa, or that's how most people understand it perhaps, taqwa is to avoid acts of sin. But even that isn't very accurate. Why? Because avoiding something is a negative 
connotation. It has a negative connotation, right? And when you interpret taqwa as being avoiding certain acts, certain places, certain individuals, because of the negativity attached to this description, it leads individuals to go farther and farther away and ultimately results in monasticism. Monasticism is translated in Arabic as Ruhbaniyyah. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ has famously declared, لا رهبانية في الإسلام There is no monasticism in Islam. Monasticism is people who are trying to avoid in almost a paranoid way, avoid acts of sin, avoid environments that lead to sin. And because they do so in a negative way and ultimately it leads them to becoming paranoid and withdrawn from society. And so they feel that the best thing for them to do is to completely isolate themselves, to become insulated, to live in a bubble. And again, as we said, this is wrong. It's not accepted in Islam for someone to go and live in a cave so that they would avoid any potential dangers or perils within society. This is unacceptable. And I've heard this from people, believe it or not. Maybe this is not an issue in this part of the world. But there are those who become so religious, so devout, that when you add that proclivity, that tendency, to the negative understanding they have of taqwa, it produces a dangerous result, which is, as I said, monasticism, withdrawal, isolation. Let's avoid contact with everyone. It's like people who are so paranoid and so terrified of pathogens and contagions and so forth that they're always, I don't know if you've seen people like that or if you've heard of people like that, they're always wearing protective gear, masks, gloves, whatever, because they feel like if they shook somebody's hands, they're going to get sick, right? The same uh, problem occurs within the spiritual realm and that has to be avoided. And the first step in avoiding monasticism and isolation and withdrawal is to interpret the term taqwa accurately and positively as opposed to the negative connotation associated with avoidance. So what is taqwa? In a nutshell, taqwa is to create an innate proclivity and an intrinsic aversion towards sin. Let me try and rephrase that. It is when you have no desire in committing a particular act of sin, not because you don't have the temptation, because that wouldn't be normal, we all have temptations, but because you have such a heightened awareness of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore the grotesque nature of the sin that's being presented to you. An example of that is, let's say I told you, would you even think about killing a newborn infant? You would say, absolutely not. Why would you even suggest such a thing? It is so grotesque. It is so heinous in your eyes. It is so disgusting, an act that you would never even contemplate it. Not even in your wildest dreams. This intrinsic aversion towards this act, once it covers every aspect of your life, is called taqwa. In other words, you may witness someone drinking intoxicants, but that does not push you towards drinking it. You won't even think, think about drinking it because you have bolstered your spiritual immune system to such a degree that when it comes to certain acts, you don't even contemplate committing them. In other words, just like 
someone who is vaccinated against a particular virus will have an immune system that is powerful enough and strong enough such that they won't pick up that virus or they won't uh, be affected by those pathogens the same way. If you have taqwa, you won't be affected by sins that are committed in society, by the transgressions that other people might present to you. You just won't be affected. And again, not being affected doesn't mean that you never have the temptation to do it. You might have that. There might be lingering desires in the deepest recesses of your soul that keep on pushing you. There's this nagging voice of the shaitan that beautifies the act for you. That's what shaitan does. Shaitan simply beautifies the sin that should otherwise appear in its grotesque and heinous nature such that people feel attracted to that sin. So when you develop taqwa, you guard yourself against those things. Again, this has a positive connotation, meaning that you won't become uh, someone who lives in a cave. You're not engaging in monasticism, right? You are not an absolute ascetic, meaning you avoid all acts of pleasure. No, you live a normal life within society. As Imam al-Rida says, كُونُوا فِي النَّاسِ وَلَا تَكُونُوا مَعَ النَّاسِ Live among the people. Just don't do the things that they do if they happen to be wrong and immoral. But live among them. Don't isolate yourself. Don't insulate yourself. Don't live in a bubble. Now, with this interpretation of taqwa, which is to create protection, to guard yourself, so as not to be contaminated by spiritual pathogens and immoral acts, you march ahead and you actualize your potential and you live your life to the full. You have no problem in this life if you are immunized, obviously. That doesn't mean that you should put yourself in harm's way. Obviously, even someone who is vaccinated will try and protect themselves from any potential harm that may exist in a society that's plagued with a viral infection. Just because I'm vaccinated, thanks to the COVID pandemic, we learned a thing or two about being vaccinated. It doesn't mean that you should put yourself in a position where you're surrounded by people who are sick, who are infected, because there is always the potential that your immune system simply doesn't have the capacity to fight off this virus. There might be mutations. There might be other viruses. So you don't want to place yourself in circumstances that are conducive to disease and infection, which is why we have many traditions about certain places that you must avoid. You never sit on a table where intoxicating beverages and wine and alcohol and that sort of thing is being consumed. Well, you might say, but I'm immune from that. I don't drink. My parents don't drink. I come from a family that's never touched a drink in their lives. And so it's okay. It's not okay. Number one, because you might be tempted, perhaps not the first time or the second time, but on the hundredth time, the act itself has been so trivialized and normalized that you might have been conditioned to it now. And if somebody tells you, well, take a sip, what's the worst that can happen? You don't want to put yourself in that position, number one. Number two, you don't want to be party to the act. You don't want to be associated with certain acts of immorality and sin. Even if you yourself don't have the potential or the proclivity to engage in that act. We have a hadith, in fact, 
that says on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish an insect because animals, while they lack the intellect for the most part, but they do have some primordial, a trace of a primordial nature within them that allows them to understand certain things, right? We might refer to it as instinct, animal instincts, how a mother loves her cubs. There is something there. Maybe it's not called the intellect in its traditional sense, the way we understand it, but they have an instinct. There are things that they do understand. And so we have a hadith, in fact, that says, إِنَّمَا الْبَهَائِمْ بُهِمَتْ عَنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ I'm paraphrasing. إِلَّا أَنَّهَا لَمْ تُبْهَمْ عَنْ مَعْرِفَةِ اللَّهِ Animals, while they've been deprived of the ability to understand most moral concepts, but they still recognize their Creator, their Lord. There's something in them that's still uh, awake, if you like. Anyway, so the hadith says that Allah will punish an insect for living in a place of sin and transgression. I don't want to give examples, but there are places where flagrant sins are committed and Allah will punish a certain insect. Maybe this is a, uh, if you like, a parable, right? Maybe it's an example to illustrate that we shouldn't put ourselves in positions where we are associated with certain acts of sin. However, that being said, when you are, uh, when you possess a strong spiritual immune system and you possess the intrinsic aversion towards acts of sin, you then march ahead. You live your life, you achieve your goals, and you don't have much to fear. You, you still have to try and protect yourself and guard yourself, but you know that you have that backing, the backing of taqwa, which helps you live your life to the max. The reason I say all of this is because there are people who try to present taqwa in a very negative light. And so even in the English language, piety is not always seen as a positive trait. Right? When they say somebody is pious, they often mean that in a negative manner. Right? They say this person is pious, meaning that you'll never be able to change their mind. They're so stubborn. They're mm -hmm. arrogant. They uh, are, suffer from self-conceit. They think they're better than other people. Right? That's the understanding that a lot of people have. Uh, when you speak about piety in the English language. In Arabic, it's the same. Some people try to present taqwa as being a limitation, a means of constraining individuals, not allowing people to engage in society and to achieve their goals and objectives. Again, this is wrong. It's not about closing doors, rather, it's about protecting yourself and guarding yourself from harmful things that happen in society. If you didn't wear shoes, you would injure your feet. If you wore shoes, would anyone say that you're constraining your feet? That you're limiting yourself? No. To the contrary, it's the most liberating thing. It frees you to be able to walk Everywhere. It just gives you that extra layer of protection. It gives you a cushion so that when you walk on a rough surface, you don't end up with bruises and blood. The same thing applies to clothes. Would anyone say that wearing clothes limits you? It constrains you? No, far from it. When you wear clothes, your garment protects you from heat and cold and allows you to go out in an environment that would otherwise be unsuitable for someone who's not wearing anything. The same thing applies to hijab. When you wear hijab, it is the most liberating thing. Because hijab, as I said, same as taqwa, it's not limiting, it's not to avoid something, rather it is to protect yourself, to guard yourself, 
From what? In the case of hijab, it is to guard yourself from prying eyes, from individuals that the Quran describes as uh, having a disease in their heart. You protect yourself, you immunize yourself, you guard yourself, now go and you live your life. Obviously not committing any acts of sin in the process, not putting yourself in harm's way, but you're able to do things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. You can live a life of contentment, knowing that men are not judging you 24-7, that they're not looking at you, they're not subjugating you, they're not putting you in a position where they enjoy themselves using you as eye candy. While you have to prove your worth to them. I feel sorry for women who have to put on multiple layers of, of makeup just to be able to walk out the door. I feel sorry for them. Even in Western society, you'll see a male presenter and a female presenter sitting next to each other, news anchors for instance, presenting the news. You'll see the man wearing casual clothes, looking comfortable, whereas the woman, you can tell she's put in at least 10 times more effort and money and time to look more presentable. It makes no sense to me why they have to subject themselves to all this torture. And I'm not even going to talk about high heels and all the clothes and the jewelry and the accessories and all these things. They have to get just to be able to look presentable to the opposite gender. I know, I've heard the arguments. I don't do it for the men, I do it for me. But really, would you do it if you lived in an island all by yourself? Come on, let's be serious. Would you do this? Would you put in all this effort if no one was looking at you? And so, it's nothing short of torture and self-flagellation that women have to put themselves through just so that other men would be pleased, just so their boss would give them a raise, maybe in five years' time. What's the point of all that? When you guard yourself, when you protect yourself, when you put on the hijab, you're making a statement. The statement is, I'm a human being, deal with me as such. Not as a female, not as an eye candy, not as a means of your pleasure and enjoyment, but as another human being. Don't abuse me. Don't take advantage of me and my vulnerabilities and my beauty and so forth. So hijab, just like taqwa, is not a limitation. Rather, it is to guard and protect the individual from harm that exists in society. If you did that, if we all, by the grace of this blessed month of Ramadan, were endowed and gifted with the blessing of taqwa, what happens is, there isn't much to fear. Yusuf lived in the palace of Zulaikha, not as a regular individual, not as a worker, not as a, an employee, a maintenance guy, no, no, as a slave which means that he was under her control for a period of seven years. Seven years. In fact, one of his tasks was to serve food to other women of royalty. Zulaikha in our traditions has been described as being the most beautiful woman in Egypt. So she wasn't just the wife of the top-ranking political leader in the country. She was also the most beautiful woman whose posse, whose homies, whose friends were also, I imagine, of similar rank and similar characterization. They were also beautiful and presentable. His job was to serve food to them. And yet, the Qur'an tells us that she desired him. In other words, he's not the one who develops this 
temptation. She's the one who takes the initiative. وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّذِي الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ Not only did she desire him, she expressed it openly. Not only did she express it openly and invite him to herself. وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكِ She even blocked all the entrances and exits. She closed all the doors, sealed the entire palace, which was already fortified. There's no one in it but her and Yusuf. وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكِ Come to me. How does Yusuf respond given the taqwa that he has? Given the fact that he has an intrinsic aversion towards this act because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despises it. قَالَ مَعَادَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي I seek refuge in Allah. Part of the process of attaining taqwa is to constantly seek refuge in Allah, constantly ask Him for protection and help. So there are things that you have to do, but ultimately you need the backing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. He's looked after me my entire life. He has provided for me. He has done so many good things for me. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Those who are oppressive, in this case meaning oppressive towards themselves, committing acts of sin, will never achieve victory. They will never succeed in this life or the next. And so he made his position very clear. That wasn't enough. In the story of Yusuf, she ran after him, he ran away from her. She tried, according to our traditions, Yusuf, while living, subhanAllah, look at what taqwa does. While living in the palace of Zulaikha for seven years, he never even gazed at her, not once. Forget about the series, forget about the movie, it's filled with inconsistencies and flaws and, and, and a whole load of rubbish, right? The actual story is like this. Traditions, the Imam, alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq, says that Yusuf never took a glance at Zulaikha, never. You might say, well, how did he serve her? Well, it's not that difficult. You try to avoid looking, and obviously it takes a great deal of willpower, a great deal of taqwa, a great deal of piety, but ultimately he never even took a glance so as not to open the door to shaitan. One beautiful hadith says that you should close all the doors towards the shaitan. Don't even leave the door unlocked because if a thief came across your house and noticed that this door happens to be unlocked, or that it's slightly open. Who do you think this thief is going to bar? Whose house do you think he's going to rob? It's not going to be the neighbor's house, which is locked and closed. It's going to be the one where the door is slightly open. Don't do that. Make sure it's closed the whole time. And so, Zulaikha, even though I didn't want to go down this, this route and talk about the story of Yusuf, I just wanted to mention the verse. But... Traditions tell us that she attempted to make him look at her. That's all she wanted. Because she knew that if he took a glance, he will be seduced by her, given how beautiful and attractive she was. But he didn't. And so she ran behind him, pushing him into a particular direction where he went into a room where the room was covered with mirrors. All the walls were reflective, the ceiling was reflective, the ground, the floor was reflective, so that whichever direction he looked, he would see a reflection of Zulaikha. Open the door, let me get in. And the hadith says that when he ran into that, that room and realized that it was filled with mirrors, he simply closed his eye. Inna Rabbi ahsan When you have taqwa, that's what happens. You might be able to live life fully in the midst of society, even, God forbid, God forbid, a society that is filled with immorality and sin, but you yourself will be protected.
Now, how do you attain taqwa? How do you achieve the rank of someone who has an innate and intrinsic aversion towards sin? Those are discussions we'll leave for another day because I want to get back to the original verse that I recited. Try and explain that inshallah and maybe we'll have time to discuss this further down the line. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tawbah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah. Have taqwa, guard yourself against the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa kunu ma'al sadiqeen. And be with those who are truthful. Here's a question. What is the correlation? What's the connection between possessing taqwa and being with those who are truthful? The answer is that this verse itself shows that there is a very strong correlation between the two. In other words, if you claim to have taqwa, but choose not to be with those who are truthful, then that taqwa will be nothing but lip service. It'll be nothing but a show for other people to see. It's about pomposity, and it's about um, claiming, it's about hypocrisy, claiming to have taqwa, when taqwa isn't really there. I'm not saying this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in this verse, اتَّقُوا wa kunu مَعَ sadiqin Otherwise you won't be able to be true believers, and you won't be able to maintain your taqwa. I'll give you a couple of examples. Imam al-Sadiq salam says, and this hadith has been narrated in Al-Ihtijaj by Al-Tabarsi as well as Al-Hur Al-Amali in his Wasa'il al-Shia and other primary sources. Imam al-Sadiq salam says that uh, there were people around me who spoke of the virtues and merits of a specific individual. I won't mention his name. But the Imam says that they spoke about how pious this man is. So much so that I desire to meet him. Imagine Imam al-Sadiq says, I really wanted to meet this man whose merits and virtues are, are the talk of the town. By the way, sometimes we also fall into this trap where we praise someone unnecessarily. And that person probably doesn't deserve all this praise, but we fall into this trap. We kind of were deceived by appearances. So the Imam says, I really wanted to see this man. One day, I was in the market, and I saw him. As I said, he was a specific individual, so the Imam recognized him. The Imam says that I noticed that he was surrounded by a group of people who were ignorant. In other words, they fell for this person's deception. They had surrounded him, all looking at him, mashaAllah. His neck is also slightly bent. His head is lowered. The way he walks is in slow-mo, right? And so, an appearance like that, and it makes you wonder, like, mashaAllah, what a pious individual. The Imam says, I wore a mask so that he wouldn't recognize me. And I kept observing him from afar. After a while, the people took one direction, he took another direction, they separated, and I kept following him. He says that I noticed he went to a baker, a bakery, and he started to speak to the baker, and as soon as the baker was distracted for a few seconds, he stole two loaves of bread, that pious guy, stole two loaves of bread and put it under his cloak. So the Imam says, I wondered, why would he do that? Then the Imam says, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I said, well, maybe the baker owed him those two loaves. But then I thought to myself, well, why would he wait until he was distracted to take them? Doesn't make sense, doesn't add up. Then I noticed that he went to someone who was selling fruits, spoke to the shop owner, and then as soon as he was distracted, he took two pomegranates and put them in his pocket, stole them. The Imam says, I wondered once again, why would he take those two pomegranates? Can I give him the benefit of the doubt? SubhanAllah, even though the guy is a blatant deviant, but the Imam still tried to justify his actions, but they were unjustifiable. 
So the Imam says that he kept walking until he reached his door. So I walked up to him. Again, the Imam is masked, so he doesn't know who the Imam is. The Imam says, I told him, I was observing you for a while, and I noticed that you stole two loaves of bread and two pomegranates. Oh, another thing he did was before he went to his house, he went to uh, a group of people who were begging on the street. He gave them the bread and he gave them the pomegranates. SubhanAllah, gave charity. The Imam says, I noticed that you stole the bread, you stole the pomegranates. Then you gave them to the poor. Why would you do something like this? Immediately, the guy became uh, defensive. And he said to the Imam, before we talk about this, who are you? He was probably afraid that it's a law enforcement officer trying to catch him in the act. He said to the Imam, who are you? The Imam said, Ana min wuldi Adam. I am one of the children of Adam. Very generic. So he wanted more information. He said, which tribe are you from? The Imam said, I am from Bani Hashim. He said, which city are you from? The Imam said, I am from the city of Medina. So he said to him, Inna ka Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You must be none other than Imam al-Sadiq. The Imam said, well, yes, I am. He said, I'm paraphrasing a statement. He said, what a shame that you have a grandfather like Rasulullah and you're this ignorant of the Holy Quran, which was revealed to the Prophet. He said that to the Imam. The Imam said to him, what exactly am I ignorant of? He said, you're ignorant of the verse in the Quran, which says that when you acquire a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies the deeds by ten. فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا And when you commit an act of sin, فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا You will only receive the ذَنْب of committing one act of sin, whereas a good deed is multiplied by ten. So let's do the math really quickly, he said to the Imam. I stole four items. Then I gave those items to the poor. When I gave four items to the poor, Allah gave me 40 rewards, 40 thawab. Subtract four sins that I committed originally to do that, I end up with 36 rewards. SubhanAllah. What a beautiful equation. So he insulted the Imam, saying that your ancestry is a shame, your connection to the Prophet Bene doesn't benefit you because you're so ignorant and here's the verse in the Quran. The Imam said to him, you are the one who is ignorant. You claim to know the Quran? You understand the Holy Quran? Well, have you not read the verse in the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهِ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah only accepts good deeds from those who are, they have taqwa. In other words, when you steal, then give what you've stolen to the poor. You're a thief. You're someone who lacks taqwa. And if you lack taqwa, Allah will not accept that charity that you gave simply because you lack taqwa. In nama, which denotes exclusivity, you're the one who's ignorant. The Imam says he kept trying to engage and to uh, to make his arguments uh, in a manner that was fruitless, that was pointless, futile. So I just left him. When a person claims to have taqwa, but they are not with the ones who are truthful, this is what happens. It's lip service. I'll give you another example. A man by the name of Harun uh, came to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and the Imam asked him about a friend of his. He said to him, كَيْفَ أَخُوكَ الْجَارُودِي His name was Jarudi. The Imam said, how is he? 
He said, Subhanallah, Ibn Rasulullah, my friend is such a great guy. Everybody loves him. The neighbors love him because he's so kind and compassionate and so forth. And so does the Qadi, meaning the governor respects him. The governor appointed by the oppressive Khalifa, he said, the Qadi, the government loves him. And so does everyone else, the entire neighborhood. He's such a great guy. But he has one tiny flaw. And that is that he refuses to acknowledge your authority. Meaning he doesn't follow you, he doesn't take you as an Imam. So the Imam said to him, why does he not acknowledge our authority? Doesn't accept us as the Imam. He responded, Harun said, he said, because he wants to maintain warak and taqwa. He wants to stay on the safe side, right? He doesn't want to do something that could potentially be haram. Right? He doesn't want to acknowledge the authority of someone and then it turns out that he had to, had to give bay'ah to the Khalifa of the day. You know, just like Abdullah ibn Umar who refused to give bay'ah to Amir al muminin because he said, I want to be pious. I'm not sure if I have to do this. I'm not sure if you're the one who's supposed to be my imam or you're qualified for this position. I'm just, you know, being on the safe side here. Then he gave bay'ah to the foot, not even to the hands but to the feet of Al-Hajjaj later on. And when Hajjaj said to him, why are you such in, in such a rush to come and give me bay'ah in the middle of the night while I'm eating? His hands were deep inside the, uh, the food that he was eating. And so he said to him, why are you such in, a, in, a, in such a hurry? He said, because I heard Rasulullah say, man mata wa laysa. Whoever does not give his pledge of allegiance to an imam will die a death of ignorance. But he refused to give bay'ah to Amir al muminin And so the imam asked this person, Harun, how is your friend the Jarudi? He said he doesn't acknowledge you because he, he wants to be muttaqi. Subhanallah. The imam said, well then go ask him, Aina kana wa ra'uhu anda nahr al where was his piety on the river, on the banks of the river Balkh? It was a river. So this friend was rather flabbergasted, thinking, what is the Imam talking about? So he went straight to his friend, the Jarudi. He said to him, فَكَلَتْكَ أُمُّكْ May my, your mother grieve over you. In other words, you put me to shame. I'm there praising you to the Imam, and the Imam tells me, that you don't have warak, you don't have piety, something happened with you on the riverbank. He said, the Imam told you that? He said, yes. He said, Ashhadu annahu hujjatullah. I bear witness that he is the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a man who's directly connected to Allah. He said, why? He said, well, this incident, no one knows about. One day, I was traveling with a friend of mine. He had a female maid who was also a singer, who was also incredibly beautiful. So we were traveling together. We reached a point, it was too dark. My friend said to me, would you go and fetch some fire or should I go and get the fire so we can camp out here? He said, no, you can go. So he left me with his female maid. Something which was not supposed to happen between us happened that night. And I know for a fact that she did not utter a word about this to anyone. And I've never told anyone about this. How did the Imam know about that? He was filled with shame. And so Harun says that next year when I went back to Hajj, I took my friend the Jarudi with me. He said, take me to your Imam. He went there and he acknowledged the Imam of Imam Sadiq He repented to Allah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Who are these Sadiqeen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The believers are truly who? الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Those who believe in Allah and His Prophet. The hadith doesn't talk about the Imams. 
because this verse is speaking about the Imams themselves. Amanu billah wa rasulihi thumma lam yartabu. Then they had no doubt whatsoever, not even for a fraction of a second. Lam yartabu. Lam tufidu al azaliya, tufidu al abadiya. Not once did they have any doubt whatsoever in their hearts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who practice jihad bi amwalihim wa anfusihim, ula'ika hum sadiqun Those are the truthful ones. Meaning those who are truthful in their words, in their deeds, in their actions, in their thoughts, in everything that they do. Meaning that they're infallible. Meaning that they never commit an act of sin in any way, shape, or form. So when Allah says, this is in Surah Al-Hujurat, when Allah says in Surah Al-Tawbah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah wa koonu ma'as sadiqeen, he's speaking about these individuals. Now, whose description is this? None other than Muhammad wa al Muhammad salawatullahi alayhim ajma'een. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. It is the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as-salam. Now, Al-Fakhr al-Razi and other Sunni scholars, they've tried to manipulate and twist the meaning of this verse. They've bent over backwards, trying to come up with alternative understandings, but to no avail. There is no other way to describe it, no other way to explain it. For you to be pious means you have to maintain a close and constant connection to those who are truthful to those who are moral and good and pious, and those who embody the characteristic nature of being truthful in every conceivable way. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that verse. In our time, that means the hujjah of Allah, God's vice general the Imam of our time, to maintain a connection with him, to constantly remember him, to converse with him, to speak with him, right? To try and walk in his footsteps, to try and please him, to do things that when they are presented to the Imam on the night of Qadr, the Imam prays for us. When God's destiny is being revealed, the Imam asks Allah to bestow His mercy upon us. That connection is not only useful, not only beneficial, but absolutely pivotal and integral to our survival, to our faith being maintained and protected until the day we die. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا they have no doubt, absolute resolve, steadfastness, no matter what challenge comes their way. Such was Aba Abdullah al Hussein. On the 9th of Muharram, that day was the day the camp of Aba Abdullah al Hussein was completely sealed off. No one could get in, no one could get out. Which is why Imam al Hussein told his companions on the eve of Ashura, Inna hadha al-layt qad ghashiyakum fattakhiduhu jamala. Maybe you can find an escape route. Maybe you can find a way to leave me and save yourselves. Which of course they refused to do so. But the point is that on the 9th of Muharram, suddenly the last of the troops of Bani Umayyah had assembled in Karbala. There were 30,000 of them, according to the lowest estimates. And in the camp of Imam al Hussein, there was no way anyone else could join him anymore. He had sent letters to Basra, he had sent letters to Kufa, he had sent emissaries and representatives to other places, but no one could reach the Imam any longer. Water was barred from reaching the camp of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Once again, if they had any water left, it all finished. And so 
You'd think that a situation like this would make a person shake, but not Aba Abdullah. ثم لم يرتاحوا أولئك هم الصادقون. In fact, they say, and this is mentioned in many versions of the passion narrative, the maqtal of Imam al Hussein, that the closer he got to his martyrdom, the more radiant his face became. The more members of his companions were killed, the more shiny that luminous face became the more his own death became certain, the more Imam al Hussein radiated and was illuminated, his face smiling, Allahu Akbar, until the day of Ashura, when all of the companions were killed, all of his family members were martyred. The Imam looked to the right and the left, فَلَمْ يَرَ إِلَّا مَنْ صَافَحَ التُّرَابُ جَبِينَ He found none of his companions except that they had fallen onto the sand, their faces on the ground. No one was left to defend Aba Abdullah. The Imam would charge against the enemy all by himself. The enemy would flee from him. Imagine the entire army of Bani Umayyah would run away from Aba Abdullah al Hussein, single handedly making them flee like a lion running towards a flock of goats, as they have described the scene. The Imam would then come back to the camp to give comfort and solace to the women and the children, whose only hope was now Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The Imam would then charge back at the enemy, then return to the camp. Then at some point, the Imam's, the Imam's strength had all but waned. His bodily, his earthly strength had been completely eroded. And so he was also wound from head to toe. He came back to the camp. And he knew this, that this was the last time he could return and that he would be killed afterwards. So he called out to the women and the children. He said, Ya Zainab, Ya Umm Kulthum, Ya Sukayna, Ya Rabab, Hada Akhir al This is the last farewell. Our next meeting will be in paradise. I won't return from this campaign. Imagine the women, the children who were inside the tents in the middle of this desert. Her entire, their entire reliance was on Aba Abdullah. Hearing the Imam say that I will not return after this. They all ran out of their tents. They flocked around Aba Abdullah, crying and weeping and shedding their tears. The Imam tried to calm them down. He said to them, don't cry while I'm still alive. You're breaking my heart. Wait, after I'm killed, you can cry if you like. So the Imam calmed them down a bit. One of them wouldn't calm down. It was his daughter, Sukaina. The Imam got off the back of his horse. He alighted from it. He then went towards his daughter. He embraced her. They've written that the Imam began to wipe the tears off her face with his hand. She said to him, Abba, Abba, ila man takiluna. You will go. We will be left abandoned. We have no one to protect us. The enemy will show no mercy towards us. They say she then said to Aba Abdullah, Aba Khudna ila qabr jaddina Rasulullah. Father, 
take us to the grave of our grandfather, the Holy Prophet of Allah. In other words, it was a last-ditch attempt to ask the Imam to return and not to keep fighting. The Imam calmed her. The Imam tried to give her solace. Then he went back on the back of his horse and began charging towards the enemy. This is when he heard a faint voice calling out, Ya ibn zahra mahlan mahla. It was the voice of his sister Zainab. Now why would Zainab say, Mahlan mahla ya ibn zahra Why wouldn't she just call him by his name or say, My brother, come back to me. I want one final farewell. The hadith says that when Musa came back from the mount, he returned to see that Bani Israel were worshipping the golden calf. He was enraged. He was furious. He came to his brother. Harun, he said to him, why would you let this happen? He began pulling him by the hair. Harun responded, it's in the Quran. He said, Ya ibn Um, inna al qawm astadafuni. He said, oh son of my mother, these people found me weak. They took advantage of the fact that I had no supporters. Imam al-Sadiq says, the reason he said Ya ibn Um instead of Ya Akhi was because he wanted to remind him that we have a common mother. He wanted, wanted to his anger to recede and to calm down. So Zainab is saying to Aba Abdullah, Ya ibn Zahra, our mother is between us. I beg you to come back. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله بالحسين الوجيه عجل اللهم فرج إمام زماننا اجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه ومقوية سلطانه اللهم ارزق الشهادة بين يديه اللهم أرض إمام زماننا عنا تقبل أعمالنا اغفر ذنوبنا اشف مرضانا خاصة المنظورين اللهم وارحم أمواتنا وأموات الحاضرين ومن مات على ولاية أمير المؤمنين والعلماء والصالحين والشهداء وخدمة أبي عبد الله الحسين إلى أرواحهم نهدي ثواب المجلس وثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوة